Welcome everybody to this week's edition of Holotube and we are very happy to welcome Charlotte Slyke from uh, Durham University and um, she's going to tell us about things that she has been doing recently and um, things that are up to come. So this, the stage is yours Charlotte, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, introduction and also for the uh, invitation to give this uh, Seminar. It's also very nice to see some uh, old faces again and also some new ones as I just uh, uh, learned. Um, so as you can see from the title of my talk, um, I'm this is going to be primarily about uh, scattering uh, in the city space. And um, the words Malin Barnes essentially mean that we develop some new tools to study such processes um, in a little bit more systematic uh, fashion. And um, this is based on these works here. Uh, on the bottom of the slide, also some work in collaboration with uh, Massimo Perona and some work uh, with Pete. And also please feel free to uh, interrupt me at any point to ask questions, at least it doesn't feel like I just sit in my room and talk to myself for one hour. Okay. Okay, so um, one of the main reasons that we study um, particle scattering and uh, in particular scattering amplitudes is that they allow us to test the predictions um, of our theories. So scattering amplitudes, they're the, they're the critical bridge between uh, theory and uh, uh, experiment. So let's suppose that you have your favorite theory, the theory that you believe describes uh, nature. If you're a serious scientist, you compute some scattering amplitude, which gives you a prediction for what happens when um, particles in your theory uh, scatter. And then once you've done that, you, you scurry off to the Large Hadron Collider, or whatever particle collider you have um, at your disposal to see how your prediction matches up against the measurements that they, that they make. And uh, uh, if they don't, you have to put your theory um, in the bin, in principle. But um, even in the case that we don't have this possibility to, to perform or to compare with um, experiment, scattering amplitudes provide us with these convenient or very nice theoretical laboratories for which we can put our theories uh, to the test. A very elementary example of this type of logic is given to us by um, general relativity, where of course, we don't have the possibility to perform experiments directly at the characteristic scale, so the, uh, the Planck scale. But by considering graviton scattering amplitudes, we already know that there's a problem um, in the applicability of GR um, at these scales. So, already at one loop you start to feel a bit nervous because you find uh, a divergence but you still retain some degree of optimism because this divergence can be can be reabsorbed but then when you get to two loops you become sad because again you find um, a divergence but this time there's, there's nothing that you can do about it and that's the end of uh, the story so um in this and in similar ways um scatch amplitudes provide us with this like very nice theoretical, theoretical scaffolding for which we can test the limitations um, of our theories. And of course, we don't put general relativity in the bin because it describes our universe so beautifully well at large cosmological um, scales. And what we know by now is that we should, we should regard um, general relativity together with the standard model of particle physics through the lens of effective field theory. So where the correct physical theory has this like onion-like structure with the different layers corresponding to the different energies with um, where potentially new dif different degrees of freedom can become uh, excited. So from this perspective, one of the main challenges that we face is to find consistent quantum theories that not only explain our existing experiments and observations, so in their low energy limit include both the standard model and um, general relativity, but they should also give us predictions for the experiments and the observations that, that we haven't yet been able to, to make. And this is, of course, very challenging um, in various respects. Uh, scattering amplitudes are very difficult to compute uh, in general, so it would seem that already we have limited access to these um, uh, theoretical laboratories. But even if the computation of scattering amplitudes wouldn't be um, an issue, the, the, the higher and higher energy that we would like to uh, describe, we increase in that guidance from experimental uh, data. So in, in the face of difficulties, um, a change in perspective is never a bad idea. And one possibility is to, in some sense, reverse the logic that I've presented so far. 
so instead of computing scattering amplitudes to, to check the consistency um, of our theories, we could use consistency um, as an input to constrain or perhaps even determine the form that um, consistent scattering amplitudes uh, should take. So this type of approach um, is, is known as a bootstrap approach and there's this magical act of lifting yourself up by the straps of your own uh, boots in a, in a self-reinforcing and self-consistent uh, manner. And uh, if implemented um, successfully, this is what would provide us with the, the theoretical data points for which we can carve out the space of consistent quantum uh, theories. So the basic physical criteria that consistent scattering amplitudes should satisfy include, for instance, um, Lorentz invariance, unitarity, and um, locality. And these are actually encoded in, in a pretty simple way. So Lorentz invariance requires that scattering amplitudes depend on Lorentz invariant combinations of the kinematic variables. Unitarity requires that S target S is equal to, to one, where S is the S matrix, and this in turn gives rise to the, um, to the optical theorem. And on a related note, you have locality, which requires that amplitudes of certain kinematic singularities that are consistent with factorization and uh, unitarity. So for instance, simple poles like this guy here um, in the Mandelstam uh, variables along the, uh, uh, the real axis that uh, corresponds to the um, exchange of physical uh, particles. So quite remarkably from these basic criteria, we, we can bootstrap a tremendous amount um, of physics. And these are given rise to powerful techniques to compute scattering amplitudes in perturbation theory, such as recursion relations to construct tree amplitudes from lower point trees, generalized unitarity methods to construct loop amplitudes from on-shell uh, tree amplitudes. But despite this tremendous progress, we still lack a complete picture of the criteria that should be satisfied by consistent scattering amplitudes. One of the most striking things is that we don't yet know what is the precise fingerprint of causality, at least beyond uh, one so the current state of the art, as frustrating as it might be, is still that if some random person off the street came to you with a scattering amplitude that they computed in their pet quantum uh, theory, it could be that you wouldn't be able to tell them uh, if they are right um, or wrong. But if we allow ourselves to move just a little bit away from reality, we have a spectacular working example of a scenario in which we know so extremely well and the rules of the game. And this is if instead of flat space, we consider theories in anti space. So like putting our world inside of a, of a tin can. And the beauty of this setup is that through the ADS CFT correspondence, such theories are equivalent to a conformal field theory that lives on the boundary uh, of the tin can. So what does this mean? So in ADS, we can perform um, experiments that start and end at infinity by like pinging things off the walls of the, of the tin can. And through the ads CFT correspondence, these observables are computed by correlation functions of operators um, in a conformal field theory. So this means in particular that all of my questions and confusions about um, observables in quantum gravity and asymptotically anti-digital space, they, be, they can be translated to sharp questions about the consistency of correlation functions in conformal field theory. And the great thing is that these are defined completely non perturbatively by a combination of conformal symmetry, unitarity, and a consistent operator product um, expansion. And these are the three main pillars behind the success of the conformal bootstrap program, which use these three basic criteria to, to carve out the space of consistent conformal uh, field theories. So given this spectacular working um, example in which we know very well the rules of the game, a natural question uh, to ask is if um, any of the techniques which led to this type of progress um, in anti-digital space um, can be adapted to improve our understanding of scenarios that are a little bit closer uh, to reality. Um, pretty good starting point uh, in this regard would be uh, to space, so uh, anti-digital positive curvature uh, cousin. And this is a nice setup to consider because it's a step away from the relative security of the ADS CFT correspondence in a direction where we might potentially learn something fundamentally new about holography itself. And this is the, the emergence of time. So, in particular, in the city, we have 
two boundaries at infinity, which are both spatial, so one at past infinity and the other at future, okay, no infinity, with time running uh, in between. But at the same time, this set retains some familiar features of the ADS-C of T correspondence that we might look to for reassurance or try to take advantage of. And one of these that we will make use of in this talk is the fact that these boundaries at infinity are conformal, which means that the, the boundary correlators in situ are also constrained by conformal symmetry, like in ADS CFT. So um, in this talk, we'll be focusing on these scattering processes in which um, all of the external legs lie on the boundary at future infinity. And one of the motivations is that these such observables are of particular interest from the perspective of inflationary cosmology, which as we know, postulates that um, the very early universe had this period of um, very rapid expansion. And this expansion may be approximated um, by the Desita uh, space time. And one of the main predictions is that uh, spatial correlations um, at the end of inflation, so on this gray spatial slice here, so say of the, the scalar or the tensor uh, fluctuations, the prediction is that as time uh, evolves forward, these correlations here give rise to correlations in the CMB or the distribution um, of galaxies. So this would then make inflation the, the highest energy observable uh, natural process where the, the energy of, of the Hubble scale uh, during inflation could be as high as 10 to the 14 uh, GeV, which is far beyond the, the reach of our humble terrestrial um, experiments. So what we see here is that inflation presents us with this really incredible um, opportunity to perhaps like, poke at the laws of physics um, at these scales, which so far remain somewhat elusive. They haven't yet poked back. And so the task that we have ahead is then to um, classify the, the effects or the imprints of potential new degrees of freedom that might become excited um, at these scales, to give a record for those which we already know uh, to exist. And this is, a, is, this is in the view to compare with future observations um, uh, of these guys here. So what I've just um, outlined is what is known as the Cosmological Collider Physics Program, and this has been pioneered by uh, numerous groups, some of which you can see here uh, on the top of the slide. And this is essentially where we view the inflationary expansion as this like insane high energy uh, particle collider. So in order to reach the goals um, of this program, precisely in the spirit of the, the bootstrap that I outlined um, a few slides ago, we need to gain a better understanding of the structure of these correlators um, on the boundary at future infinity, so on the gray spatial slice. What are the rules of the game uh, that they that they play. So how do, how is unitarity, how is consistent time evolution encoded in the analy analytic structure, for instance? But at the same time, we have to carry out the complementary task of um, developing systematic uh, techniques to to evaluate them. So recent years have seen significant progress um, in this direction, with some key steps taken by this ever-growing and most likely incomplete list of groups here on the bottom of the slide. And many of these indeed drew inspiration from the successes and the strengths um, of the Scattering Amplitudes program. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on explaining the contribution of this group of work uh, here. And the aim was to um, explore how techniques for studying scattering um, in antidesis anti um, might be adapted uh, to visitor. And let's first note that this question is not entirely unreasonable because at the end of the day, many of these techniques were developed in Euclidean ADS because oftentimes it's simpler to work um, in the Euclidean signature. And Euclidean ADS shares the isometry group um, with the space spacetime, so I wouldn't be too shocked if there are some things that, that do carry uh, over. But um, despite these types of similarities, we really can't forget that these two space times are rather different beasts. And um, one major difference is that the Desita background um, is time dependent. So this means that in contrast to the um, perturbative computation of correlators on the boundary of Euclidean um, ADS, um, in Desita, these boundary correlators are computed within the so-called in-in or schwinger keldish uh, formalism. And for those of you who might not be too familiar, this is where essentially you have to take an extra bit of care when um, evaluating the bulk um, time intervals. So you first have to 
integrate from the initial time to the time that you're interested in. So for us, the boundary at future uh, infinity in a time ordered fashion along the so-called plus branch um, of the in in contour. And then once you've done that, you have to integrate back in an anti-time ordered fashion along the so-called minus branch um, of the in in contour. And you have to do this for each of the, the time integrals in your um, Feynman diagrams. And I'll be using this terminology plus branch minus branch at various points uh, in this uh, talk. So these types of um, differences, they make at least a direct application of many such Euclidean ADS techniques um, far from straightforward, at least in the current way um, that they are, they are formulated. And so one of the main objectives um, of our work was to see if there is some way in which we can try to um, level the playing field between boundary correlators um, in these two space times. And to this end, we found it um, rather convenient to adopt a type of um, Mellin bounds representation for boundary correlators in momentum space, which I'll introduce um, very shortly in the first part of uh, my talk. So, Mellin bounds integrals you might recognize as contour integrals, which involve products and ratios um, of gamma functions, where the integration contour is usually taken to run parallel to the branching axis. So, on the side here, you're looking at a well on an example of such um, a Mellin bounds representation, so that is the, the Gauss hypergeometric function, so that the 2F1. And then this Mellin bounds representation is responsible, um, it's, it gives the, um, the analytic continuation of the, of the hypergeometric series to the entire uh, complex plane cut along the positive real uh, axis. And uh, this representation is actually facilitated establishing many properties of the hypergeometric functions, such as identities, transformation formula, um, asymptotic um, expansion. And these statements also carry over to our Mellin bounds representation of the boundary correlators uh, um, in momentum space. And in particular, what we found is that by adopting such a representation for boundary correlators, both in ADS and uh, uh, De Sitter, we found that this is a useful um, tool to, to explore their, their structure and also to forge identities which hold between boundary correlators in these two space times. And it's using these identities that you can directly import um, techniques, results, and also understanding from um, ADS uh, to, to De Sitter. So, um, so after introducing this Mellin bounds representation uh, in the first part of the talk, um, in the second part, I'll explain how, how we put some of these ideas um, into practice. And the simplest thing to start off with are the, are the, the contact diagrams, which are the basic building blocks from which we can construct more complicated um, observables. And we will see how using the Mellin formalism, we can immediately express um, a contact diagram in situ in terms of its ADS uh, counterpart. And at the three-point level in ADS, these are completely known, classified for any triplet um, of particles. And for higher points, at least in the case that they, they are not known, they, they're much simpler to construct uh, in Euclidean ADS. And we'll then move on to um, exchanges, and we will see both for, for ADS and uh, De Sitter, how starting from the knowledge of the constituent three-point contact diagrams that mediate uh, the exchange, we will see how the Mellon formalism allows us to quite straightforwardly implement the, the basic consistency criteria of locality, so factorization, um, conformal symmetry, and uh, boundary conditions, which fix the corresponding tree-level um, exchange, so precisely in the spirit of the bootstrap that I outlined um, a few slides uh, ago. We'll also see how we can express um, an exchange in a specific vacuum um, of the sitter as a specific linear, as a certain linear combination of exchanges um, in the anti space. And then if there's time towards um, the end, I'll explain how we can use this formalism to um, derive constraints on the interactions of massless particles, both in ADS and uh, uh, the sitter, in a similar spirit to um, the famous um, Weinberg result uh, in, in flat space. So before I continue, are there any um, questions uh, at this point before I dive into part one? Okay. So for good, or then maybe it's not needed for this audience, let me review some very quickly some bread and butter um, of the ADS CFT dictionary, um, a major part of which was laid down in the early days by Gubza, Kerman, Polikov, and De Witten. And this essentially boils down to the fact that the ADS CFT correspondence identifies the generating function of correlators uh, in the conformal field theory um, with the partition function of the, the, the full partition function of the would be quantum gravity theory in anti space. 
where the boundary value phi bar of some elementary field phi um, in ADS um, serves as a source for a corresponding local operator O uh, on, in the conformal field theory, where the spin J of that operator is equal to that of the elementary field uh, that sources it. And the scaling dimension delta plus of that operator is related to the mass of the elementary field through this identity uh, here. And through these identifications, um, endpoint correlation functions of local operators in the conformal uh, field theory are identified with um, endpoint scattering processes of their dual fields um, in antagonistic uh, space. So what we did was to um, define or um, identify um, a Mellon bands representation for such boundary correlators um, in momentum space. And so to introduce it, we have to take the Fourier transform with respect to these position vectors x here on the boundary. So to replace them with um, boundary momenta ki, so like on the left-hand side uh, here. And for a given boundary correlator um, describing some scattering process uh, in the bulk space-time, we introduced this Mellon bands representation by associating to each of the external legs uh, in our scattering process, which will each have some boundary momentum uh, ki, we associate each of them a corresponding, what we call external Mellon variable um, si, where the magnitude of the momentum on the boundary um, enters the Mellon representation in the way that you can see here on the slide. So with an exponent that is fixed by uh, the corresponding external Mellon variable uh, si, as well as the scaling dimension of the corresponding operator um, on the boundary. And each of these external legs um, is accompanied by two infinite families of poles in, in the Mellon variable SI, which are plotted here on the bottom of the slide. And these turn out to be the, the poles in the Mellon bands um, representation of the, of the corresponding external propagator associated to each of these external legs, so the bulk boundary uh, propagators. So in Poincaré coordinates, um, in ADS, these are essentially modified Bessel functions of the second kind. And the Mellon bands representation of such modified Bessel functions is precisely characterized by these two infinite families of poles that are interdispersed and they head off to, uh, to minus infinity. So for instance, if you have a scalar field of general mass, um, its bulk boundary propagator in Poincaré coordinates is given by the modified Bessel function of the second kind. And in the second equality here, I gave its Mellon bands uh, representation. And what you can see is that these two infinite families of poles here are encoded um, in these two gamma uh, functions. And notice that the location of these poles depend on the mass of the external particle, which enters through the scaling dimension uh, delta plus using the identity that I, that I reviewed. So this one here uh, on the previous um, slide. So an interesting um, observation is that, um, and I'll look at this to how translation invariance um, on the boundary implies um, moment, uh, conservation of the boundary uh, momentum. In a similar way, the, the dilatation more densities imply um, a similar constraint on the corresponding external uh, Mellon variables. So they have to sum up to some constant, and I will give some examples of this constant um, in a moment. And analogous to how the momentum conserving uh, delta function um, arises from an integral of a position x on the boundary, so where x in Poincaré coordinates parameterizes the boundary um, directions. And the direct delta function enforcing this constraint on the external Mellon variables, it can be written in an um, analogous fashion as an integral now over the bulk radial uh, coordinate. And in Poincaré coordinates, we usually call this um, uh, z. So for me, it would be interesting to understand if there is something that is to be learned from these nice parallels that we can draw between momentum space and this Mellon bands um, representation. And whether this would make um, this Mellon representation some kind of convenient habitat for boundary correlators uh, in momentum space. But this isn't something that we would explore uh, much beyond noting these nice parallels uh, here. So the simplest type of um, boundary correlator is that which corresponds to um, a three point contact diagram. So these only have um, external legs and there are three of them. So according to this prescription, um, it's many bounds representation is described by three external Mellon variables, S1, S2, and S3, one for each external leg. So in addition to the boundary momentum K1, K2, and K3. Um, translation invariance on the boundary enforces momentum uh, conservation. And the dilatation order densities require that um, these external Mellon variables, S1 to S3, add up to this constant here. 
which you see depends on the boundary dimension D and the spins J of the fields that participate uh, in the cubic vertex. Uh, here. If we also have um, an internal leg, so for instance, like um, in a four point exchange, um, to describe internal legs um, in this Melin formalism, we introduce two what we call internal Melin variables, um, U and uh, U bar, where the magnitude of the momentum on the boundary associated to each internal leg um, enters in the way that you can see here. So with an exponent that is fixed by the sum of these internal Melin variables, uh, U and uh, uh, U bar. Continue these parallels between momentum space and this Melin bounds um, representation. You can see that similar to how um, momentum conservation um, relates this momentum ki on the internal leg to the external uh, momentum k1 to k4. So for momentum conservation at a cubic uh, vertex. In a similar way, these internal Mullin variables u and uh, u bar, they related to the external Mullin variables uh, through the constraint um, that we wrote down on the previous slide for Mullin variables that are connected through um, a cubic vertex so in a completely analogous uh, fashion. So what we found is that by um, adopting such uh, a Mellin bounds representation for boundary correlators, um, both in ADS and uh, uh, the sitter, we, we found that this places their computation on a more uh, equal footing. And the thing which really lowered the drawbridge um, for us is that in this Mellin formalism, propagators in Euclidean ADS and sitter, they take a universal uh, form and the construct essentially had a free basic uh, building blocks. So if we focus first on propagator and Euclidean ADS for a field of generic mass M and spin uh, J, um, the rightmost building block um, is the corresponding harmonic function, which means that it solves the, the source-free um, equation of motion. And it means that it encodes the, the physical exchange single particle state. So in particular, in the Mellin representation of this um, harmonic function, and the residues of poles in this internal Mellin variable u and u bar, they give you the contribution from the physical exchange particle. This is analogous to um, simple poles in the Mandelstam variables of flat space scattering amplitudes whose residues generate the contribution from the physical exchange single particle uh, state. And in ADS, you can also implement some boundary uh, conditions, which is in implemented by this middle building block here, the, the yellow one. And this is a linear combination of these functions omega d and omega uh, n, whose role is to respectively implement the Dirichlet uh, boundary conditions. But of course, the most general, and um, here, here is a linear combination uh, of the two. So it's reviewed here on the bottom of the slide for some scalar field phi uh, in ADS. So, so some field phi uh, in ADS. So um, the explicit form of these functions, um, omega d and omega n, it's quite simple. Um, they don't contribute any pole to this Mellin representation. They're entire functions of u and u bar. As you can see here on the slide, they're given explicitly by this simple product of sine uh, factors here. And essentially what um, happens is that the zeros of these um, sine factors, they um, overlap with the offending poles of the harmonic function that would violate the, the boundary condition that you want to implement out of Dirichlet and Neumann. So these functions here, they serve as projectors onto these two boundary uh, conditions. The final building block um, is this co-second factor, and as is written, its role is to encode the contact terms in the exchange process. So um, the combination of the green and the yellow building blocks that we've considered so far, they just satisfy the, the source-free equation of motion with some uh, boundary condition. And this co-second factor ensures that, um, so the, the combination of the yellow and the green, they just give you the the on-shell form of the, of the propagator. And um, this cosine factor ensures that um, the propagator satisfies the equation of motion um, with a direct delta function source uh, on the right-hand side. And uh, for consistency, if you put the internal leg on shell, which I denote by this red cross, which you can do in practice by taking the cut or the discontinuity with respect to the internal uh, momentum, this cosecant factor gets completely cancelled and you get back the, the combination of the green and the yellow building blocks, which give you the, the on-shell form. I see someone put something in the chat, but I can't. That's just uh, me putting the slides, the link to the slides. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. Um, so this is the Mellon Bounds um, representation of the propagator in Euclidean uh, ADS. Um, in the sitter, 
within the um, the in in formalism to each field there is associated four propagators since the two points uh, in the propagator can each sit either on the plus or the minus branch uh, of the in in uh, contour. So you get all possible combinations so plus plus minus minus plus minus minus plus which gives you four propagators um, in total. And each of these propagators take the same form um, as their ADS counterpart that I introduced on the previous slide. So they're built from um, analogous building blocks which have the same role um, as their ADS counterpart. Um, so what we mean in the situ by implementing um, boundary condition is to choose a, a vacuum um, at early times. And uh, in situ there's a whole one parameter family of vacua that you can choose from the so-called um, alpha vacua. And the vacuum that we usually work with is the so-called Bunch Davis or Euclidean uh, vacuum. And the reason why is because this is the unique vacuum that extrapolates to that of flat Minkowski space at um, early times. And the word Euclidean here is referring to the fact that you can arrive to this um, vacuum by analytically continuing from the Euclidean uh, sphere. And so to work with this Bunch Davis vacuum, so to work with this boundary uh, condition, it corresponds to this to making this particular choice for the coefficients alpha uh, and beta that multiply our projectors omega d and omega n. Okay. And we'll be making this choice for the rest of this talk. So from this point onwards, I'm going to focus on boundary correlators in the sitter in the Bunch Davis. Um, yeah. So the crucial bridge between um, propagators in these two space times is that at the level of this million bands representation, um, the harmonic function in the sitter is given by its counterpart in Euclidean um, ADS, multiplied by two very simple uh, phases in U and uh, a U bar, the internal million variables, where the sign of these phases depend on the branch of the in, in contour that they are two points in the bulk um, are sitting on. And you can actually establish this relation by analy analytically continuing from um, ADS to, to the sitter. So taking your harmonic function in Euclidean ADS here on the right hand side, writing it in Poincare. Uh, coordinates and quick rotating to the expanding Poincare patch uh, in the sitter. And it's this rotation which gives you, that introduces these uh, phases here. And it turns out that the direction of rotation, so clockwise or anticlockwise, dictates whether you land uh, on the plus or the minus branch um, of the in-in contour. If you take the, the boundary limit, you get both boundary uh, propagators and by definition, these are external legs. The melanin representation is described by a single external melanin variable, uh, S. And for a given boundary behavior, which I just call uh, delta, um, a bulk boundary propagator uh, in the sitter is given by its counterpart in Euclidean um, ADS multiplied by a very simple phase of the same type. Where again, the sign of this phase depends on the branch of the in, in contour that this point here in the bulk um, is uh, sitting on. So what we found is that by um, adopting such a melin bounds representation for boundary correlators. Um, so so, yeah, so the, these observations, uh, they're, they're significant because they tell you that within this melin bounds um, representation, the, the differences between uh, boundary correlators um, in these two space times, it just amounts to a simple collection uh, of phases. So this really provides a setting in which we can try to extend in a pretty concrete way as we we'll see existing techniques and results um, from ADS uh, to uh, visitor. So let's explore how this works um, in practice, starting off with the, the contact diagrams. And as I advertised, um, within this Malin Barnes formalism, um, a contact diagram in the city can immediately be expressed in terms of its ADS uh, counterpart. And at the three point level, these are known uh, completely. And to see this, um, all you have to do is take the melin bounds representation of your contact di your three point contact diagram in anti visitor uh, space. And for each leg that it has, you multiply it by the, the phase which um, converts that propagator in ADS to a bulk boundary propagator in visitor on a particular branch uh, in, in contour. So using this identity here uh, that I introduced two slides um, ago. And um, the overall phase that you get. So, so this gives you, so once you do this procedure, this gives you the contribution from that particular branch of the in, in contour to the decitor contact diagram. And the overall phase that you get when you apply this procedure, so this guy here um, is a constant because we, you see that this overall phase depends on the external melanin variables only through their sum. 
And we know that the sum of its standard money variables is a constant by virtue of the dilatation uh, awarded entities. So to summarize this slide, um, the contribution from a given branch of the in-in contour to a de Sitter contact diagram is given by its ADS counterpart multiplied by a constant phase where the sign of that phase is dictated by the branch uh, of the in-in uh, contour. The full de Sitter um, contact diagram is obtained by for summing the contributions from the plus and the minus uh, branches. And what happens is that these constant phases which have um, opposite sign, they combine to give this constant sign factor here multiplying its, the, the, the three point contact diagram in anti de space. So to summarize, if you have a three point contact diagram uh, in ADS and you multiply it with this sign factor here, you obtain its de Sitter uh, counterpart. And let me also say that this carries over in the obvious way to contact diagrams involving any number n of external legs, so carrying out exactly the same uh, steps. And so I just flashed the result here. So you would just replace three with n um, in the obvious uh, uh, places. So an interesting consequence um, of this sign factor is that it can happen that uh, a contact diagram in the sitter uh, is vanishing um, even if its ADS counterpart uh, does not. And this occurs when the boundary dimension D, the skin dimension delta, the spins J, and the number of legs uh, N um, conspire to give a zero of this um, sign function. And this can of course happen in, in various weird and wonderful um, ways. Um, with some interesting examples given by uh, three boundary uh, dimensions, so D equals three, which means that we're in um, four dimensional decitor space. So for instance, if we consider um, contact diagrams of conformally coupled scalars, so which means taking the scalar dimensions delta equal to one and spins j equal to zero and plugging them into our sine function here. You see that in this, in this case, the, the sine factor that you get, it has zeros when the number of legs n uh, is, uh, is odd, meaning that contact diagrams of conformally coupled scalars with an odd number um, of legs are vanishing uh, in the sitter. So this and um, other interesting examples were also recently shown to follow um, as a consequence of perturbative unitarity uh, in the sitter space. So um, that by this group, this work here by the, the Cambridge uh, group. So they showed it to follow as a consequence of deriving um, the cosmological analog of the, of the optical theorem. And from their work, this inspired us to understand that um, this sign factor that we have here is in some ways selected by perturbative unitarity uh, in the sitter. And in the Mellon formalism, we could understand this because this sign factor originates from these phases which take us from ADS uh, to the sitter. And these phases, they're, they're fixed, as you can see here, by the, by the bulk boundary propagator in the sitter, which is what encodes unitary time evolution um, in the bulk. Okay, so we know that the three point contact, in some way, the, the three point contact diagrams um, we just considered are the basic building blocks from which we can construct uh, exchanges. And to explore how this could work um, in the Mellon formalism, uh, let's start off with the exchanges um, in anti space, which have been well studied using a variety of techniques. So we have a lot of prior intuition uh, to draw on. And once you've understood this work, so yes, using the Mellon formalism, we can extend all of the steps uh, to um, exchanges in, in the sitter space. So we've seen um, in the introductory slides that in this Mellon formalism, um, a propagator can be reconstructed from its on-shell piece, which I denote by this red cross here, uh, by multiplying with this cosecant factor, which includes the contact ends. And this has some nice significant consequences when it comes to constructing um, boundary correlators uh, in this framework, because it means that we can just focus on the on-shell piece, which is a much simpler object to deal with and uh, uh, to construct. So in the following, we can just focus on the on-shell exchange, which I denote by this red cross, and we're basically uh, done. And this is constrained by a combination of um, factorization. So um, this means that by locality on-shell an exchange must factorize into its three point uh, sub diagrams, just like uh, in flat space. But in EDS and also the sitter, these are constrained by also by conformal symmetry and any boundary condition that you want to implement uh, on your fields. 
so we've seen that boundary conditions are quite straightforward to implement in this smelling formism. It just amounts to multiplying by the appropriate, the appropriate linear combination of the projectors um, in the internal smelling variables u and u bar. So because we can in some way correct for boundary conditions um, at the end, let's first focus on the requirements of factorization and uh, informal symmetry. So to try to satisfy um, factorization, um, one thing that you can try to do is um, consider the, the free point contact diagrams generated by the cubic vertices that mediate um, your exchange for all possible combinations of boundary conditions on the exchanged uh, particle and just multiply them uh, together. And if you do that, there's a unique object that you can form which is consistent with conformal symmetry. And it's this guy here that you're looking at on the slide where one internal like which I denote by the blue lines um, is subject to the delta plus boundary condition and the other the delta minus uh, boundary condition. So in the conformal field theory literature, this object actually has a name. It's called a conformal partial wave and it has some uh, useful properties. Um, in particular, it's the unique single valued um, eigenfunction of the conformal uh, Casimirs. So this object is consistent with um, factorization and conformal symmetry. It describes the on-shell exchange of a particle uh, in antiseptic uh, space with a boundary condition that is fixed by the definition of the conformal partial wave um, itself. It's some uh, linear combination of Dirichlet and uh, uh, Neumann. So to access more um, general boundary conditions, the, the key thing to note is that this conformal partial wave here um, on the boundary is the uh, boundary counterpart of the harmonic function in the book that we were using to construct our propagators with uh, in the Mellon formalism. So in particular, the, um, the source free equation of motion satisfied by this harmonic function is equivalent to the quadratic Casimir equation satisfied by the conformal partial uh, wave. And you can, and this duality is made uh, manifest by the so-called um, split representation of harmonic functions, which is where they factorize into a product of two bulk boundary uh, propagators, um, one subject to the delta plus boundary condition and the other subject to the delta minus uh, boundary condition. So this level, you can go from one to the other by just attaching or removing uh, the external uh, legs. So to implement a given um, boundary condition, what you can do now is you can take the conformal partial wave that you fix by combination of factorization and conformal symmetry, and you multiply it by the appropriate linear combination of the phases, um, sorry, uh, the projectors, um, omega d and omega n, that um, implement that boundary condition at the level of the, of the core corresponding propagator, as we saw um, earlier on. So this is the final form um, for the on-shell exchange, which we fix by a combination of factorization, conformal symmetry, and boundary conditions. And an important thing to note is that in obtaining this expression, we didn't have to evaluate any complicated uh, bulk integral because we essentially bootstrap this expression um, from the knowledge of the constituent free point conduct diagrams, which uh, are known for any um, triplet of, uh, of particles in ABS, so of any mass spin and cubic coupling uh, that uh, uh, connects them. Then the final step um, to obtain the full um, exchange uh, amplitude is to multiply by this uh, cosine factor that encodes the, the contact terms. So multiply the on-shell exchange that we just determined by this cosine factor. And essentially the, the, the poles in U and U bar that are introduced by this um, cosine factor, they generate the effective field theory part of the exchange from its uh, uh, on-shell uh, piece. So having fixed the exchange uh, in antithesis space, um, using the melon band representation, each of the steps that we just taken, we can carry over uh, directly to uh, De Sitter. And um, in De Sitter, the only real um, difference is that within the in in or schwinger keldish uh, formalism, the exchange decomposes into, into four contributions from each branch of the in in uh, contour. So then, the level of uh, the on-shell exchange, um, each of these contributions, so each term in this sum. So just, just like um, in antithesis space, they're constrained by a combination of uh, factorization, conformal symmetry, and boundary conditions. So the level of these, each of these contributions, we just continue like we did uh, in antithesis uh, space. So in particular for factorization, you take the constituent three-point contact diagrams, now from the appropriate branches um, of the in-in contour, which I denote by this subscript uh, here. And uh, you multiply them uh, together. And again, if you do that, the unique object that you can form, which is consistent with 
a conformal symmetry is a conformal partial wave. So where one internal leg subject to the delta plus boundary condition and the other uh, the delta minus uh, boundary condition. This is in fact proportional um, to the conformal partial wave that we saw uh, in antalicita uh, space. And we can understand this because um, as we saw when considering contact diagrams in this formalism, a three point contact diagram in the sitter is given by its ADS counterpart multiplied by a constant uh, phase. So this conformal partial wave here is essentially normalized so, so that it's consistent with factorization um, in the sitter as opposed to factorization uh, in anti sitter uh, space. And at this level, we can effortlessly pass um, from ADS to the sitter. So for instance, taking the conformal partial wave uh, in ADS and multiplying each leg by, by the phase that implements the weak rotation to the appropriate branch um, of the in contour uh, in the city. So this level we can um, continue like we did uh, in ADS. So having obtained our conformal partial waves fixed by factorization and conformal symmetry, we can make sure that we're in the Bunch-Davis uh, vacuum by multiplying each of these conformal partial uh, waves by the appropriate linear combination of projectors omega d and omega n that fix that boundary condition at the level of the corresponding uh, propagators. And as, as I said before, this corresponds to this particular choice of these coefficients uh, alpha and beta that multiply our projectors uh, here. And to obtain the full on-shell exchange um, we have to sum the contributions from each of, each of the four contributions within the in, in uh, formalism. So just like um, in ADS, we fixed the on-shell exchange in the sitter by a combination of uh, factorization, conformal symmetry, and boundary uh, conditions. And um, the final step again is to, to obtain the full exchange, uh, is to multiply the on-shell exchange by this uh, cosecant factor that encodes the, uh, the contact dance. So um, having placed uh, exchanges in um, ADS and the sitter on a, on a similar footing uh, with the aid of this melin bounds uh, representation, it actually doesn't take much to see that um, an exchange in the bunch davis vacuum uh, of the sitter can be expressed as a specific linear combination um, of ADS exchanges. So this, in particular, this identity uh, here where one of the ADS exchanges is, is subject to the, the Dirichlet boundary condition and the other the, uh, the Neumann uh, boundary condition. So to derive this um, identity, all you have to do is go back to our expression that we just derived for the Dissiter exchange in the Bunch-Davis vacuum. So for these values of alpha and beta uh, here. And you recall that three point conduct diagrams in the, on a particular branch um, of the in, in contour are given by the ADS counterpart multiplied by constant phase, so the identity that we establish when considering uh, contact diagrams. And it's this identity which is the, the critical bridge to do exchanges in anti space. So in particular, if we plug in this um, three point, this, this identity into our expression for the decider exchange, the, the, the ADS three point diagrams, they completely factorize out of this sum. And when you perform this sum, these constant phases, they then combine to give you this precise product of sign factors that multiply each ADS and the exchange. Where the exchange with Dirichlet boundary condition is read off from the part of the Desiter exchange involving the projector omega t, while that with Neumann boundary condition is read off from the part of the Desiter exchange involving the projector uh, omega uh, n. Um, so notice that this um, product of sign factors multiply applying each ADS uh, exchange, um, they're precisely the sign factors that would um, convert the frequent conduct diagrams that constitute the exchange in ADS to their decider uh, counterparts. So the appearance of these sign factors, they precisely accommodate for the, for the change in three point function uh, coefficient as you move, or, or OPE coefficient as you move from uh, ADS uh, to decider. And just like at the three point level, you can regard the appearance of this um, product of sign factors as being selected by uh, perturbative unitarity. So why do I find um, this identity uh, interesting? Um, so what we have is an identity that holds between exchanges uh, in the Bunch-Davis vacuum of the sitter and under the space, which holds regardless of the way that we choose to um, represent the, the two. So position space, momentum space, whatever space that you're interested uh, in. So this really provides us with um, a, a, a way to, 
to, to directly import the techniques, the results and understanding from ADS uh, to Zipta. And for me, this is particularly exciting given the increasingly central role that has been played by um, ADS exchanges in the bootstrap of plain vanilla uh, Lorentzian conformal field theories, so dual to physics um, in ADS. So in particular, these are the basic solution to the crossing equation, which is this all important equation that enforces associativity of the operator uh, algebra. And the hope is that through this um, uh, identity, uh, we can then, it, it might be useful to explore the bootstrap of Euclidean CFTs um, dual to physics uh, in the city space. So this we started to explore, um, very, we, we, we took some small steps in this direction in our re recent paper uh, uh, here. So in particular using this identity, you can already infer properties of the sitter exchanges which um, are inherited from their ADS uh, counterparts. And one very important property of ADS um, exchanges in, in Euclidean regime is that they're single valued functions of the cross ratios. So this ensures that they admit a well-defined decomposition uh, into conformal blocks in all channels, meaning that they solve the crossing uh, equation. And from this um, identity here, we can infer that the situ exchanges in the bunch Davis vacuum are also single valued functions of the cross ratios. They also solve the crossing equation because they admit a well-defined decomposition into conformal blocks uh, in all channels. And their decomposition into conformal blocks is inherited from the known such decomposition of ADS exchanges into conformal blocks uh, in all uh, channels. Um, so apart from properties, we can also import technology. And um, using this identity uh, in our recent paper, um, we, we used it to, to define um, melon amplitudes for um, boundary correlators in the sitter. And the motivation is that at least in anti-sitter space, um, melon amplitudes have proven to be an instrumental uh, tool owing to the striking parallels that they have um, with flat space scattering amplitudes. And so the hope would be that through this um, identity, we might be able to develop a similar level of intuition for boundary correlators um, in the sitter. So given that there's three minutes, I think I will yeah, I think I will go to the, how much time would you say I have left? Well, you have um, started a little late, so uh, at least five minutes late. So um, you definitely have five minutes or so. Like, I see. Um, you, you should you should do what what, um, what your plan was. I see, okay, I will, yeah, I'll continue then and see yeah, how long it takes. Um, Okay, so when coming back to this melon bands representation of the situ exchanges, um, let's explore a little bit uh, how this packages uh, the, uh, the physics. So the signal indicating that a, that a particle exchange um, has taken place, so the signal that would distinguish it from um, a local quartic contact amplitude, um, this is particularly sharp uh, in the limit where the exchange momentum Ki uh, is soft, so its magnitude is a lot less than that of the external uh, momentum. And in the language of conformal uh, field theory, this limit is referred to as the operator product expansion limit or the, the OPE limit. And in position space, this corresponds to taking the two pairs of points to be uh, far apart. So the behavior of your boundary correlator uh, in this limit is a good diagnostic of whether or not a particle has been exchanged between these um, uh, two pairs of uh, points. So this limit of exchanges um, in ADS and also De Sitter has been explored um, in numerous works. Um, our analysis is most similar in spirit to that of the Kanye Med and the collaborators. So these worked here on the bottom uh, right, who also use conformal symmetry and basic consistency, including factorization to classify um, such uh, uh, particle exchanges in the case that you have external conformally coupled and massless scalars and three boundary dimensions so of interest from the perspective of inflation. And um, using our melon formalism, we could extend or generalize their results to general boundary dimensions uh, D in a generic collection of um, internal and external uh, particles. So it turns out that this melon formalism is quite a useful tool to explore soft limits um, in any of the momenta. With the expansion of the correlators in this limit are generated by the residues of uh, poles in the associated melon variable. So if you're interested, for instance, in the soft limit of the momentum Ki associated to the internal uh, leg, 
the expansion in this limit is generated by the residues of poles in the corresponding external uh, internal money variables u and u bar. And this you can understand because the manager of this momentum enters the money representation in this way here. So an exponent that is fixed by the sum of u and uh, u bar. So for the on-shell exchange, um, the only source of poles um, in U and U bar comes from the constituent three-point uh, contact diagrams here, or the conformal partial uh, waves, because the only other dependence in U and U bar comes from these projectors, which we know don't contribute any pole, they're these product of sign uh, functions. So I plotted these poles um, in U and U bar coming from each three-point contact diagram um, here on the bottom uh, left. And these are the poles in the Menin Barnes representation of the bulk boundary propagator associated to these um, internal legs uh, in blue. So these are precisely the poles that we saw earlier on. They, they, they are the poles of modified vessel functions of the second kind. And again, recall that the location of these poles depend on the mass of the exchange particle in a somewhat similar spirit to scattering amplitudes in flat space, so which are encoded in simple poles in the Mandelstam variables, which generate the physically exchanged single particle uh, state. And the location of that pole in the Mandelstam variables depends on the mass of the exchange particle. So when the exchange momentum Ki um, is soft, uh, this integration contour can be closed to the left, which indeed encircles both infinite families of poles. So the residues indeed generate the expansion of um, the exchange in this uh, uh, soft limit. So on the slide here, I plotted this schematic form I gave the schematic form of this um, expansion and um, focus on, the, on first on the case that all of the fields in the exchange um, are scalars. Where it turns out that each family of poles um, in U and uh, U bar is responsible for generating a family of non analytic terms here in the exchange uh, momentum. Where in particular, if you look at how the magnitude of the momentum enters the million representation, it doesn't take much to see that um, the, the poles here. Um, below the real axis are uh, responsible for generating the family of non analytic terms here um, on the first line, where the pole fairways to the right generates the leading contribution and the poles to the left um, generate the, the sub leading uh, contributions. And the poles family of poles above the real axis generate this family of non analytic terms here uh, on the second line. So these um, non analytic contributions, they're the characteristic signal that a, uh, that a particle exchange. Um, has taken place. So these non-analytic terms, they, they can't be emulated by um, a local quartic uh, contact interaction, for instance. Where you see that the exponent of the exchanged um, momentum enters the Mellon representation uh, in the way, so it's, um, it's the, the exponent is fixed by the, the late time behaviors delta plus and uh, uh, delta minus of the exchanged uh, uh, field. And the fact that you get contribution from both the delta plus and the delta minus um, modes is a, is a consequence of our choice of bunch Davis vacuum. So this ensures that both modes reach the boundary and the future of infinity. But if instead, so yeah, on a practical level, um, this arises because the coefficients of the projectors omega d and omega n in this representation for the exchange are both uh, non-zero. So if instead only the coefficients of omega d are non-zero, then this family of non-analytic terms here on the second line would be uh, absent because the poles that generate these um, non-analytic terms have been cancelled by the zeros, these yellow crosses here uh, of the projector omega d, which were given by this product of sine functions. So the poles have been cancelled and um, projected out. And so this family of non-analytic terms here has been projected out. And um, perhaps this scenario is more physically meaningful um, in antithesis is space where it corresponds to implementing the Dirichlet boundary condition. And similar statement for the other projector, uh, omega n. So when only the coefficient of that is non-zero, then this family of non-analytic terms here on the first line uh, is uh, absent. Um, if instead the, the exchange field has uh, integer spin uh, j, then in this the expansion, in this soft limit, there's um, an angular uh, dependence. So dependence on this angle uh, theta here and in general boundary dimensions uh, D, this is given by um, a Gegenbauer polynomial whose degree encodes the spin J of the exchanged uh, uh, particle. And in the Mellon representation, or in this representation of the, of the exchange, um, you can see that this angular dependence arises because the, um, the constituent three point contact diagrams now have a tensorial uh, structure. And in the case that you have external scalars, this tensorial structure is being 
contracted to form a scalar uh, object. And it's these contractions which introduce a dependence on this angle uh, theta here. And if you have spinning external legs, then in, in addition to this uh, Gegenbauer uh, polynomial, um, you get a, uh, a, also a tensorial structure. And this tensorial structure is um, uh, inherited from that of the constituent three point contact uh, diagrams. So, so far, I've only focused on the contributions from um, the on shell exchange. Um, in the full exchange, um, another source of poles uh, in U and U bar comes from this uh, coskin factor, which are these um, red dots uh, here. So, the residues of these red dots or red po poles, these can only contribute terms that are analytic uh, in the exchange momentum because the coskin factor incurs the contact terms. Uh, in the exchange process. So in particular, if you, the, the residue of the nth pole, um, which lies to the left of the integration uh, contour, um, this is proportional to the nth power of the exchange momentum squared, which is of course uh, analytic. And the coefficient of this time is then given by the, the remaining Mellin bounds uh, integrals. And what you can show is that um, the coefficient of these terms admit an expansion in the inverse mass of the exchanged um, particle which is consistent with the interpretation of such um, contributions as the effective field theory part of the exchange, so the, the, the low energy um, approximation. So the final part of the talk, I wanted to talk about constraints on massless particles, but I can also wrap up if there's no time, and then if anyone is interested, I can explain it um, afterwards. So I'm open to... Yeah, I can I can summarize I think so I think yeah, maybe that's the best yeah 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 so um yeah to, to wrap up um there are plenty of uh, diverse directions uh, to, to go from here in the future um or part of a program to systematically construct um boundary correlate or systematically study boundary correlators uh, in this many formalism um some obvious you know, steps would be to um, consider higher point and loop diagrams um, in this framework and um, to see what one can learn. And one would continue, con con continue in exactly the same way as I presented in this talk for the exchanges. So you focus on uh, the on-shell piece, which is much simpler objects to, to construct. And you can do that by just gluing together these basic building blocks in a consistent fashion. So guided by factorization, conformal symmetry and uh, boundary conditions. And as you would expect, um, or might expect um, there's a nice parallel that emerges with the Kokoski rules um, in flat space, as you can see here already with the, the Kandy uh, diagram. And uh, this is similar in spirit to existing um, unitarity methods in ads -CFT. Um, A second point that I want to mention, um, I would be quite curious or interested to, to understand if our res results could be, or our framework could be of use in the bootstrap of Euclidean CFT, tool to physics uh, in the Zitter. So in particular, if the sitter exchanges could play an, an analogous prominent role to their uh, ADS uh, uh, counterparts, in particular, the non-perturbative uh, level. And this might be facilitated by the identity that we derive between exchanges in ADS uh, and the sitter. Um, the final point maybe is a little bit more speculative. Um, I would be quite curious to understand if our results could apply also to flat holography. So in particular, the study of celestial uh, amplitudes. And um, where it's tempting to suggest that conformal symmetry on the celestial sphere might um, constrain the exchange there to take a similar uh, form. But of course, you would replace the three point, the constituent three point functions here with those on the uh, celestial sphere. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. And uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for the nice talk. Um, do we have questions? Martin has a question. Yes, I've got a, I've got a couple of questions, but let me first begin with a simple one. Um, so suppose uh, let's do it concretely for ADS three, okay? Um, and of course, in ADS three, we um, classify our say conformal blocks according to um, say in highest or lowest weight representations of of SL two R. Yeah, let's yes. just focus on global blocks. Um, now you say you found a way to uh, formulate this in terms of uh, the sitter space, where we also know it's of course also a copy of SL2R, mm -hmm. but it's a different copy because in, in anti-de-sitter space, you look at um, 
at basically at the universal covering space, uh, universal covering group, while in the sitter, it's just the, the usual SN2R. So I'm just, so my question is what about like all the things about representation theory, which should also enter the, uh, the dual uh, description of the sure. CFT? Yeah, that's an, yeah, if you want to ask me this question, actually, like, I should make it clearer <laughs> in the talk. Yeah, so I think maybe the key point, if I've understood correctly, is that when deriving this expression, for instance, for the exchange and also these identities that hold between the ADS and the sitter, I didn't care whether my particles were unitary representations or not of the isometry yeah. groups. So these scaling dimensions I took completely generic. They could be non-unitary if you wanted. And so basically when, when you want to regard um, a particular object as an ADS object or a decision object, so that's when you would, if you want to use it to get some physics, you would of course then focus, restrict to those values of the scaling dimensions, which corresponds to uh, unitary representations. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. So it's like, yeah, I take the scaling dimensions to be completely generic, be very careful. In fact, when deriving these expressions because of this smelling representation, um, you know, because it's defined as as a contour integral which becomes ill-defined when the the poles pinch the contour to do this actually to be very careful you have to make the scaling dimensions sit on the principal series otherwise the, in some for some values of the scaling dimensions some important ones like component like, like massless scalar that they, they pinch mm -hmm. and so deriving this expression we take the principal series and then when we want to do some physics we analytically continue and then sometimes for important representations, you get some singularities and you have to be a little bit careful and regularize them. I see, good, yeah, thanks. Other questions? I have one that um, is going back to the beginning of your talk where you start where you drew the connection or analogies between the momentum uh, representation in in a certain sense of scattering amplitudes and then the the melon barns yeah yeah this this is a good slide so i i i'm a bit hung up on this and uh, like maybe maybe it's just because i'm i'm not understanding this this right so Maybe you can help me. Um, so when you when you use the Fourier representation, um, you you can gain something because if you are working in a in a translation invariant theory um, in a translation invariant state, then for example, you can you can tr translate your um, momentum your your equations of motion for say perturbations into into Fourier space without like without having to to like you're trading um, representations between position space and momentum space mm -hmm. and the reason for why why you why, why you, you can do this um is that you um that you have eigenfunctions right the Fourier modes are eigenfunctions um of your uh, momentum operators which are the derivatives in the equations of motion so mm -hmm. silly question so just because it it's you you wrote this nicely next to each other right there um can you do something or are you already doing this um with the external melon variables as well um no we haven't uh well, i haven't had time <laughs> even to explore this uh um, Might be just a silly idea. so I, i'm i'm just trying to understand if yeah uh, but you see where it comes from, right? So like um, maybe, ah, there's a type, no, there isn't a typo. So for instance, yeah, because in this Melin representation, um, yeah, maybe actually I have another slide, um, backup slide, infinitely many slides. Yeah, so um, yes, yeah, so you have your Melin representation of your book boundary. Uh, propagator, mm -hmm. which is given by this guy. And so to get your this diagram here, you then have to integrate over the, the radial coordinate z, which is what gives you this Dirac delta uh, function. And so you need this because if you then, you need the, the reason you can interpret this Dirac delta function as being coming from the dilatation, uh, the, the correlates must transform in the correct way in dilatation, because if I scale, we scale this momentum here, the, the, you, you get some factors, if you scale it by lambda, 
then you get some factor lambda to the power of some sums of million variables and some boundary dimensions, and scaling dimensions. Mm -hmm. And so in order to transform correctly, you need this direct delta uh, function. But the, mm -hmm. this uh, analogy, yeah, to me, it's very striking. It's very nice when I saw it, but uh, yeah, I haven't, yeah, I haven't had a chance to, to explore it any further along the lines that you're, that you're saying. Yeah, it might be just a very silly idea. The, the, what, why I thought about it is because you, you wrote your, um, on the previous slide, um, you wrote, uh, for example, your, your um, correlators, I think, or your representations um, in terms of, of both the, the momenta and the uh, melon variables. And so I was just, I mean, one, one simple version of my question would be, can you, can you represent um, any object uh, just in terms of the external melon variables, um, like without, like the basically, integrals? say again. You mean without the integrals? Yeah. I, and uh, I do not know. I mean, this, yeah, I just this. that's what we do here, basically. But there you have to momenta, no? Also. Ah, you mean? In without the momenta as well. So the yeah. moment, moment uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, you can evaluate the momentum integrals and also get some kind of, like, well, you would be in position space then, but with some melon integrals. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can also do that. Okay, yeah. okay. But, but it might still be just a silly idea because I don't see how what no. to, what you would gain um, because- I think it's silly. <laughs> I, 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 I think, think in what general, you... I'm, I'm an ultra fan of this melon representation because mm -hmm. I can really, I feel like I have some control over the analyticity properties of the of the function. I'm very happy when I'm looking at many things. Yeah, I mean the idea is only the, you can represent in, in in momentum space. You can represent um, uh, derivatives as uh, simply just a momenta, and you turn a, a integration or a derivation derivative problem into a just an algebraic problem. It's and the same here. It's yeah. the same for the Melin representation. So as you can mm -hmm. see, like, um, yeah, if you act with um, the Z, you would get some, um, yeah, it's a, ni a nice, um, yeah, the, in our paper that hopefully will appear soon, please, um, is you can, for instance, you know, the derivative interactions, so like, I don't know, um, phi, phi four, but with some derivatives on. You can represent this, you can trade these derivatives uh, in your million bands, in, in your um, interaction with a specific polynomial in these external many variables. And I didn't have a chance to present it, but this allowed us to um, study quite systematically um, four point amplitudes in this many forms, I mean, the and also ADS. And using these algebraic properties, we could solve like in impose constraints like gauge invariance quite systematically and we could derive an analog of Weinberg's uh, result also in the city in ADS. So yeah the, the the this property that I think you were hinting at is uh, yeah it's useful and uh, we've managed to use it in some way. Okay cool so that's in your upcoming paper yeah like a usage of that and application of that. Okay good thank you then maybe it was not too silly. Yeah. Are there any other questions? No no it wasn't Martin, you said you had more. Do you, do you want to ask him now or after? Are you muted, Martin? We can also do it afterwards. Okay, good. Well, then maybe it's time to close the official session and um, end the recording. So, but before we do that, um, thank you again, Charlotte. And thank you, everyone, too. Yeah.